Hello, uh, good evening everybody, and welcome to tonight's What It Takes to Be a Successful Entrepreneur. This is very exciting because not only is it the first What It Takes event of the What It Takes series, it's also the first event that we're holding live in person in over two years, so let's talk about it. <laughs> and it's a pleasure to be uh, presenting the presenter tonight, and so I thought it might be worth uh, introducing myself a little bit. My name is Alex Jones, and I work for Westminster Enterprise Network. And for those of you who don't know what we network are, we're the department of the university that helps promote students to start their own business or start their freelancing career. Entrepreneurship and freelancing has always been something that's excites me. Ever since uh, we were in year eight, and my first introduction to entrepreneurship was selling sweets on the school bus. And that was my first kind of start to my own business, and I absolutely loved it. And I think essentially it was me recognizing a gap in the market. And the gap in the market was that kids have money in their pocket. And an hour and a half on a school bus and nowhere to spend their money. So I'm going to walk up and down two, two school bars, one with my books and pencil case and whatnot, and one for chocolates and fizzy drinks, and I was just, you know, eating on the school bus. And it was wicked, with my own business, I loved it. So from then on, I did kind of, yeah, last time being in the world of entrepreneurship, and then when I was at uni, um, I kind of started a second business, or <laughs> the selling suite is really a business, but uh, I started a business called Wave Bagels, which was um, selling rainbow bagels at music festivals. And it was really cool, and I branded it in a really cool way. But however, unfortunately, in 2020, due to the pandemic, um, I had to stop doing this. So, so yeah, that was a shame. And then now, alongside working here at Westminster Enterprise Network, um, I have a side hustle called AJ Socials, which is a freelance social media marketing agency whereby I have a couple of clients, and yeah, I just give them an online presence, and yeah, just kind of give them the social media. So, before I present our speaker today, I am just going to go over some housekeeping rules. So, firstly, to note that this talk is being recorded. It will be edited and made available on YouTube when it's ready, and we'll send you a link via email. There will also be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the talk, and there will be members of the team in, in the hall with Roman mice, so just free to put your hand up, and they'll come over to you so you can ask your questions. Graham has also set up a Slido page of the QA section as part of his presentation, so feel free to put questions in there too, and I can put them to Graham at the end. Cool. So now enough that way, I'm just going to present our speaker. Graham started his career in the finance sector, working for the London Stock Exchange, Bearing Securities, Union Bank of Switzerland, and Merrill Lynch. In 1999, he bought a digital camera and discovered there was nowhere to get high-quality photographic prints. He wrote a business plan on the tube each morning to solve this problem and got some of his colleagues to invest, as well as his friends to join him as a co-host. Together they started Photobots, initially having to buy as a small business over time, they raised more money, merged and acquired other businesses, expanded into Europe, and eventually sold to a private equity firm in 2016. Graham now advises on entrepreneurship and pro bono courses. During this talk, Graham will summarize his own career after graduating from Westminster and how this led to him start his entrepreneurial journey. He'll explain how his small startup called Photobooks eventually owned Moonpig and how to discuss the business and personal highs and lows on the way. So please, everybody, put your hands together to welcome Graham Wilson. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? All right, good. Uh, I've got no clicker, so I'm going to have to stay fairly close to this keyboard. So I'm going to talk for about uh, 40 minutes, and as Alex said, I'm going to talk you through my journey and the highs and the lows. Um, we'll have some questions, uh, and I'm going to show you a spider link. Uh, so I don't know if you want to scan this now. Uh, being a cheapskate, I've got a free plan in Slido, so it only allows 100 people to participate. Um, but if you go to uh, this link, you can either go to slido.com and put in UOW or scan the QR code. If you go to that link, there's two things you can do. There's a Q&A section where you can ask me questions anytime during while I'm talking and then we'll go through them at the end. And there's also um, a short poll, which I'd love if some of you participate in. And it's asking you what your likely career path is over the next five years. And we're going to look at that in a couple of minutes. So if you do get a chance to just click on that one poll, I'll, um, I'll review the, the results shortly. So, first of all, can someone tell me what the word entrepreneur means? Person who finds gaps in the market, yeah. Anything else? Um, someone who takes risks. 
someone who takes risks, yeah. Startup, someone who runs a startup, yeah. All of these are um, what we understand entrepreneur to be. Um, who speaks French in the room? Okay, young, young man in the back there. So, what does the word literally mean? Like entre, what does that mean? Uh, okay, what, what's another meaning of entre? Uh, yeah, it could be between. between. between yeah, and preneur, based on the verb prendre, to take. Yeah, and, and preneur is someone who takes, right? So I know I'm being incredibly literal here, but um, the, the word can mean someone who takes and between. And I think this is a really important de definition because. For me, entrepreneurship is about making connections. It's about um, spotting an opportunity, meeting somebody at a party, and then two years later thinking that's the perfect person to help me set up that company or solve that problem. Or seeing two different products and thinking they would be amazing if they were combined together. Um, or, yeah, just right time and right place, making those connections between things. And I think, um, People who want to be entrepreneurs have to be open to those random connections and making those connections. So, uh, as you heard, I, I came here. I was here in 1986, that's when I graduated. I was at the New Cavendish Street campus for uh, computer science. Um, 86 is a long time ago, none of you were born then. Uh, it's the year that Stranger Things was set, if that helps you uh, figure out the era. Um, and also, computer science was kind of half theoretical then. <laughs> Not everybody had access to computers. Um, at the time, we all take the internet for granted now, but computer communications were really just starting to emerge that year. In fact, I think I bought a kit from Maplin and built my own modem, which was 300 bits per second. Um, so pretty slow, it's about typing speed. Uh, my connection at home now I think is 1.2 gigabits per second, so uh, considerably faster. But yeah, 86 was a fun time to be here at uh, the University of Westminster. Um, I don't know about you guys, but we only had two lectures on a Wednesday and they were really boring, so I used to skip and go to Leicester Square and sit and see a movie. <laughs> and uh, um, those two lectures I used to skip were database theory and statistics, which I thought were dreadfully boring. And then when I started my career, those were probably the two things I had to end up using the most. Um, so I, I graduated, I, um, I got two job offers from the milk round. One was uh, to work for the London Stock Exchange in technology, and the other one was to work for a small uh, computer reseller in High Wycombe. And I can't remember why, but somehow I favoured the High Wycombe job, and my dad said, are you crazy? Uh, take the LSE job, and that's what I did. So I, I ended up working at... London Stock Exchange for two years. Um, it was an amazing time in financial markets. There was this thing called Big Bang going on where financial markets were being liberalized and technology was flooding in. Uh, and I, I got a chance to learn a lot about professionalism and how to use my skills. Um, I, have to, I have to also say, um, the 80s was a very um, great time for social mobility in the UK. My university education, unlike yours, was completely free. I didn't have to pay tuition. In fact, for the first few years, they paid me to come to uni, paid my expenses, um, and that was a great thing because I, uh, you know, I had a nice middle-class upbringing, but my parents were kind of distracted, and uh, I'm not sure whether they would have paid for a university education. And, by having access to free university education, it kind of transformed me from a very poor academic student and very unfocused to somebody who had a degree and ended up getting a good career path. So, uh, yeah, worked at the London Stock Exchange and then I went on to work for three different investment banks over the next 10 years, um, always in technology, but um, getting exposure to trading markets, equities, derivatives. Um, and learning, learning my skills. So, uh, let's have a look at the Slido poll. Um, uh, is it? So, 
So it's not jazz I want you to look at, it's a different thing. Okay, so what you guys said, still changing a little bit, is um, the number one choice is that 38% um, of you in the room want to ideally start your own entrepreneurial business, run it and scale it in the next five years. And that's admirable. And I'm going to see whether I can put you off in the next 20 minutes. Uh, the next choice after that is work for someone else, earn and learn. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, okay, that's good. We'll work with these, these top two and come back to those. So, and don't forget, you can ask questions at any time and we'll come to them in the end. So, I had this technology career and I've been working for banks and to be honest, it was great. I got paid really well. I had really interesting work. Um, investment banking was like the Wild West in the 1990s. It was good fun. We felt like we were playing with technology and defining new ways of working. But I got to the point where I was... 35, and I, I was married, and I had two small boys at the time. They were three years old and one year old. Um, I've got three grown up men now for sons, but uh, at the time, two, two young kids. And my wife and I used to take lots of photos, uh, and I'd go down to Boots every couple of weeks with a roll of film and get it developed. And I remember having this shelf, a uh, bookshelf at home, that was just kind of filling up with these packs of photos, and I reflected on the fact that um, we weren't being very selective, you know, every roll of 36 pictures, some of them, well most of them were crap, some of them good, it was, film cameras were a weird thing, right, you take the picture and you hope it's going to come out well, but in some cases the flash didn't go off or it's out of focus, and I just wanted to be more selective, and you know, I'm a tech guy, right? I wanted to play around with the gadget, and so I bought a digital camera, a Sony camera, and it produced beautiful, sharp, colourful pictures. And I put them on my computer screen and they made great screensavers and I could look at the, the pictures. But my wife said, yeah, cool, but how do I get prints? How do I put them on the wall? How do I give a copy to my, uh, my mother and all this stuff? And there was, it kind of feels strange now, but there was no way to get prints. You couldn't get them online, you couldn't get them on the high street. Um, any of you ever owned an inkjet printer? Yeah, a few of you. Okay, so these were things that like took forever to print one thing. Whenever you went to use them, the inks had dried up. Uh, it was on crack paper, so not a, not real photos. So that wasn't an option. And I thought it can't be that difficult, right? It's basically one of those big fat print machines you see in the back of boots. It's a website and some kind of order management thing in the middle. How difficult can it be? And um, there was lots of other stuff going on. I guess I was at 35 at that kind of reflection point. Um, is this the job I want to be doing for the next 20 years? Do I want to try something different? Do I uh, want to take some risk? Um, and I, I reflected on those things and thought, maybe I'll try and start this company. So on that point, I think most of you in the room, about 40% of you said you want to start your own entrepreneurial business in the next five years. And one of the things I learned is you've got to feel well equipped to do that. You've got to have the right foundations. And at age 35, which I'm sure feels very old to most of you in the room, um, I, I already had 14 years working in industry. I built up some savings confidence and connections, um, colleagues, and I felt quite well equipped to, to jump off and do something else. And I think, um, hopefully during my story you'll hear that starting your own business is, is risky and uh, it taxes your mental health and you don't get much sleep and all of these things and definitely drains your savings. And you have to make sure you give yourself the best possible chance. So, I think whenever you're about to do this type of leap, make sure you feel well equipped, ready, you've got some domain knowledge about what you're about to jump into, 
So there's this point where you should evaluate, are you ready? And at age 35, I did feel ready, um, but I didn't quite know what I was getting into. So, um, to be honest, all I wanted was the print service. If Fuji or Kodak or Acura had launched uh, an online photo printing service, I would have been quite happy to go and use that and give up this weird idea. But it wasn't happening, and I used to sit on the tube every morning going into my job, which uh, at the time was you know, in the Morgate area, and I had my laptop, and I used to sit on the tube, and I'd start to write a business plan. And it was, I don't know if it says that, I think it was about 16 pages long. And for me, I'd never written a business plan before, but it was really simple. I wanted to create a print service, and I was just breaking it down into different parts. How would I attract customers? What type of technology was involved? How was I going to get the funding for it? How much money would I need to create such a company? It was basically a whole bunch of questions that I was asking myself, and I was trying to answer them in this document. So I wrote this business plan, and I started to talk to people at work, and I was at the time working for Merrill Lynch, and some of my colleagues were very wealthy traders, and this was 1999. Which was an absolute bubble in the internet online space. That everybody seemed to be starting a, a website. Uh, Amazon had been running for a couple of years. Um, there was this mad gold rush to get businesses online, and everyone said, "Oh, I'm doing a website. I'm doing an online service." Um, so when I spoke to people and said, "I've got this idea for a photographic print service online," they were like, "How much money do you want?" That was their first question. How much money? And I was. Oh my god. So um, I thought about it, I wrote this business plan, shared it with some people, and then thought, okay, I'm going to go ahead. And I said to people, okay, I'm going to raise £480,000. I don't know how I came up with that number, well, I do know how I came up with that number, but I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but in the space of one week, I had people who had given me £480,000. On average, they gave me about 15000 each. Some gave me 30, one person gave me 45,000. I, I felt like a complete fraud. I opened a NatWest bank account and paid in close to 500,000 pounds. And I had 16 sheets of paper, and that was it. And um, yeah, suddenly it hit me that I've got to do this. So I'm going to ask you for another definition. What, does, what do you understand the word serendipity to mean? Yes. Yes, a lot of luck coming together at the same time. So good fortune, good luck, um, things happening that are coincidence. And I started to feel like there was an enormous amount of serendipity going on at the beginning of the photobox journey for me. Um, and. Well, to give you an example, oh, sorry, didn't work. I will, do you know what? My emoji aren't working, so that fills me with terror because I mean, some of the slides aren't going to show anything. There's an emoji on here of a toothbrush. So just imagine you're looking at a toothbrush. Um, uh, one example of serendipity was that I wrote this business plan and I felt pretty confident about the money, the technology, and what service we would offer. I had absolutely no idea about marketing. I don't, I'm still to this day terrified of marketing, don't know how it works, don't have a good instinct for it. But I knew I had to find customers somehow for this service. And whenever I used to go to my dentist in my 20s, you know, have a check up, whatever, he would say to me, oh, you work in technology, my cousin runs PC World. And every time, this mantra, oh, you work in tech, my cousin runs PC World. So I thought, hmm, how would I reach people who bought digital cameras? What if I could put a voucher in the box of everyone who bought a camera at PC World? So I phoned my dentist, and I said, can I have your cousin's phone number? And he gave it to me, and I spoke to this guy, uh, Colin, and it turned out Colin didn't work at PC World anymore. He'd gone on to another company. But he came in and met, he met me, and he told me um, he used to be a senior director of Dixon Stores Group, he'd run PC World, 
He used to run Boots Photographic in the UK. He knew everybody in the photographic industry at Kodak and Fuji and Agfa. He, um, he brought the first mini hats into the UK in the early 1970s. And uh, I explained to him what I was doing, and he said, this sounds amazing. I'd love to be your chairman. And, uh, and that random connection of my dentist telling me that his cousin around PC World led to me finding an amazing chairman who really helped us get the company going. Similarly, my first finance officer, CFO, uh, he was my wife's cousin's boyfriend. And I thought he was an accountant for parts, and it turned out that he was a, uh, a financier who helped US and, and British companies raise money and floats float on the NASDAQ uh, stock exchange. So these kind of connections came together. Similarly, my co-founder, Mark, I convinced a friend after four attempts of him saying no, I convinced a friend, Mark, to come in and join me. And Mark brought very different things to the table than I had, different skills. So all of these things, these serendipitous things were one way that we got the company going, and actually they continue to happen all along. And I think it's a manifestation of us as entrepreneurs making connections between things and remembering that random fact from two years ago. So embrace, embrace serendipity, it's very important in entrepreneurship. So uh, yeah, when you have half a million quid in the bank, it doesn't mean your life is glamorous. This was our first office in Warner Street in Clerkenwell. Um, we put a uh, laminated sticker on the door to say who we were. We inherited a bunch of crappy shelves from, a, uh, I think they were a photocopying leasing company or something. Uh, so we, we made some desks out of uh, doors or something like that. And uh, we had a, a little server rack. There was no such thing as AWS then, so we had to host our own photos. That unit with lights on there, was our first storage array, 64 gigs of storage, cost us 10 grand to two people to lift. Uh, obviously, all of your phones have more storage than that now. But yeah, this was our first office and we were in that space for three years. So, in the early days, there were lots of things the startup doesn't have. And our particular problem was we had no way of marketing, no way of reaching customers. These days, I'm pretty sure if any of you start a business or um, work for an early stage business, it will attract customers by using Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, Google AdWords. None of that stuff existed. Google did not exist when we started Photobox in the year 2000. Um, there was no uh, infrastructure that we could use. We couldn't use cloud services. We couldn't use AWS or Google Cloud. So we had to build everything ourselves, our own websites, um, our own tech completely. And that meant we burnt through two thirds of that 500,000, 480,000 incredibly quickly within a few months. Um, so we had to buy the printer as well because the other thing is when you do a startup, no banks will ever loan you money. So we couldn't, we couldn't get a loan to lease the equipment. We had to pay cash for it. So, uh, yeah, very lean days. But this issue about marketing was really biking me. And uh, we tried doing leaflet drops and leaving them in tube stations. We sponsored uh, one of my dad's suburban golfing events. Uh, none of that stuff seemed to work. I got interviewed on LBC one night about what I was doing. And I was convinced our servers would melt down with all the thousands of people registering after hearing me on the radio. I think we got 12 registrations, so it just wasn't working. And we just realized that in order to win customers, we'd have to figure out what they wanted and deliver it. And when, when I launched Photobox, which was May 2000, we only offered like three print sizes, six by four inch prints, five by sevens, eight by tens. That was it, three print sizes, nothing else. But we said, we're gonna make the most amazing print service, and we made three promises to our customers. Um, we said, if you order by 4 p.m., you're going to get your order tomorrow morning on your doormat. It's going to be amazing quality. You, 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 you won't believe how much better than 35 millimeter it is. And if you're unhappy for any reason, uh, we'll just give you the money back. And so we, 
We wanted to create a service where our customers felt valued and loved and they got a great service and they would tell their friends that this is the way to get prints these days. And to be honest, it was very, very slow going, but that did work. We did build up steadily um, revenue over time, although it was a long, slow journey. I think it took, it took me more than 18 months to get to my first thousand pounds a day. So quite slow growth. The other thing was the timing of our launch. So this is the NASDAQ exchange uh, index. And you can guess the day we launched, which was that one there. And whilst it's great to launch into a bubble, because everybody gets so enthusiastic about your company, what we found was that two weeks after going live, no investor wanted to touch us. They thought that the internet was dead, consumer internet businesses were not going to work, and at this point, we burned through probably 90% of our money. Um, we had to pay a couple of developers to build the website, to build the internal systems. Uh, we were paying some small salaries. Um, but yeah, most of the money had gone, and we always planned to raise more money as soon as we went live. And uh, we had a plan for somebody to invest a million pounds uh, for 20% of the company, and it was a Middle Eastern investor, and it just went away. They, they weren't going to invest anymore. Um, so we had a real problem that we were about to run out of money. I think we, we worked out we had about five weeks left to live. Um, but in the end, we convinced our existing investors to put a little bit more money in, about 100,000. And Mark and I said, this is it. We're just going to run this as a small business, the two of us. We're not going to have any employees for a while. And that's what it was, a small business. And yeah, like I said, we kind of went into hibernation mode. And the net effect of this um, was that we ran a small business for way too long. And I realized that I should have changed my plan a couple of years later and said, OK, we're live now. We're growing. We've got good revenues. We've proven we can do this. Now is the time to go faster, raise money, go and talk to venture capital companies. But we didn't, and that was my bad. We stayed in small business mode way too long. Uh, everybody was getting a bit frustrated, and uh, I had somehow in my head that VCs were evil. They were people who would take control of your business and dominate things. Um, I later learned that they're really nice people who help you grow your business, but at the time I was reluctant. So one of the um, personal effects of this for me were that when I worked in banking, I used to love to get a coffee every morning after lunchtime, and you know, a coffee, what a posh coffee these days costs what two pounds fifty, two pounds eighty, three pounds, something like that. I think even then it cost about two quid, and that two quid or four quid a day just couldn't do it. And if I took my kids to, to the park at the weekends uh, and they said, "Can we go and get a hot chocolate?" No, that would be like fifteen quid to do that. So the, the thing that symbolizes that period of austerity for me for five years and more was no coffees, uh, none of the treats. I sold my car, I remortgaged my house, we stopped going on foreign holidays. Um, so it was a really lean time. And my wife was incredibly supportive, uh, but she, she also said, what's your plan? You know, are we going to do this forever? Um, and I think around 2005, I started to feel like we had to shift up a gear. So I said to Mark, my co-founder, um, this is the time when we have to grow the business and raise money or stop doing this and go back to our banking careers. And uh, the plan we came up with was let's, we'd already at this point become UK market leader, which sounds amazing, but we were still a small business. But we said, okay, if we can be the main print service in the UK, let's try and expand into Europe. But we don't have any European credentials, so let's go and try and find a small European company we can buy with somebody else's money and then expand into Europe. So that was our plan. We were going to do a small AIM listing, it's like a small stock market listing, um, and raise money from that and then go and buy a European company. And we started to do that. Um, we found a, a tiny little Swiss company that had only seven employees, but they were running in 
um, you know, about eight countries. And uh, they look perfect. We negotiated a deal with them and flew over to do what's called due diligence, where you start to kick the tires, check everything is as, as, they, as you expect it to be, they're telling the truth. And I discovered on that first day uh, what seemed to be a big problem, which was if, if I looked at all their orders, they'd never charged any VAT. And I asked them about that at dinner that night, and said, how come you don't charge VAT? And they said, well, we're Swiss. I'm like, but you've got customers in Germany, right? And they said, yes. And I said, where do you print for those customers? They said, in Germany. And I said, so how come you're not charging German VAT? And they said, ah, oh, it's fine, it's fine, we're Swiss. Anyway, it turned out they weren't fine. They owned as, uh, they owed as much money in VAT as we were willing to pay for the whole company. So the deal fell apart, and we phoned up our nearest rivals in France, two guys that had started a very similar company to Photobox. And we didn't trust these guys at all. We've met them many times, but we never let them see our lab. They never let us see theirs. We just, it was like ice cream wars, you know, kind of petty, but we didn't trust each other. But anyway, we phoned them and said, we've raised some money, uh, or about to raise some money. We'd like to move into Europe. How about putting the two companies together? And to cut a long story short, they said, okay, but they wanted to raise the money from US VCs. So uh, we merged, and uh, the company was called Photoways. They were based in Paris. Um, we put the two companies together. We were probably turning over, I don't know, three million pounds on the UK side, three million euros on the French side, and um, we suddenly had this bigger company. And uh, I remember that I went over on Eurostar, and the investors said, but we're not sure that the French founders are going to stay. They might move on. Will you, will you run the company? And I said, I really, I felt out of my depth six months ago. Now you want me to run a European company as well, or possibly move to Paris? So I said, um, I don't feel ready to do this. And my colleague Mark, he didn't want to do it either. So we said, help us find a new CEO. So we found this guy, Stan. Um, Stan had come from AOL. It's a bit weird. I had to fire myself as CEO and hire a new one. Um, and I decided to take responsibility for the technology in the company, so to become the CTO. And Stan instantly became the hardest boss I've ever had in my life. I hired him, and if ever I see his number come up on my phone on a Sunday evening, my heart would sink. It always meant something bad was going on, and he was going to, you know, Ball me out for it, but um, it was, you know, it, it really worked to have somebody experienced who knew what they were doing. Uh, so you can see a couple of pictures from the period shortly after that. We started to invest in technology people. That's our first hackathon. Uh, we were really starting to industrialize uh, our production. That's one of our French factories. We had one in London as well. Uh, that one uh, specialised in producing photo books. At that point, we'd invented the photo book in Europe, and uh, we were, had giant machines that printed the internal pages and the covers, and they all get bound together. And then, when people order different products, they get put in pigeonholes to match up. So you can see the kind of industrialisation kicking in. But I. I feel like I've, learned, I've worked for about four different companies along the way, and each stage presented new challenges. And in 2007, this is about a year after we merged the two companies together, I, I said, oh, I'm doing tech now, so I can make big promises about tech, and it will all magically happen. And one of the things I naively promised was I said, we've got like six websites across Europe. I'm going to build one super website that does everything in all languages. So we're going to have this you know, web 2.0, amazing drag and drop, uh, social media enabled website. And um, I'll build it for you. I told the board, you know, give me, I can't remember, like 10 people and nine months, and I'll build this amazing website. 18 months into that project, I had the most awful burnout. I, I remember being on holiday with my uh, family in Sweden for 
per week, and um, the project is going horribly wrong, and I just spent the entire week on email, trying to firefight stuff, didn't enjoy family holiday at all. My wife will tell you that's completely normal. If we were up a mountain or on a boat, my phone would go off and there'd be some code red going on, that the website had crashed or something. But I was really getting worried about this project. And I came back to the UK, um, I remember going on some client visit, we were going to meet a partner, and I, I was starting to feel like I was having a panic attack or something in the car. I felt like, I don't know, I couldn't breathe properly. Um, we had the meeting, somehow I got through it. Came back to London and I thought, I, I'm having a heart attack, I have to go into hospital. So I went to a &E, and they checked me out and they said, no, no, your heart's fine, you know, is there something else going on in your life? And it turned out it was just like a panic attack. But for months I felt like I, I can't cope with this. And um, there were a lot of things that I ended up reflecting on that I wasn't sleeping well, I wasn't having a good diet, I definitely wasn't exercising, and um, I, I went to my boss, I went to the new CEO, and I said, fine, I'm not, I'm not able to do this, I don't know how to deliver this project, and I'm out of my debt. And he wouldn't take my resignation, he told me to take a week off, and then come back to work with fresh eyes, and evaluate the project, and he said, whatever it takes, you tell me what you need. You need more people, you need more time, you need to change the spec. Just figure it out and come back to me with a plan. And that's what I did. And I kind of took it step by step. And we got that project back on track. It did take two years to finish that project. And even then, that new website was dog slow for the next six months. But we got there eventually. And I kind of learned the power of, you know, stepping back, looking with fresh eyes and reevaluating what needs to be done. Oh, kind of emoji. Um, so, the next few years, um, when we went live with that website in 2008, and even though that website nearly destroyed me, it was an amazing engine of growth. We suddenly had this full service website that we could operate anywhere in Europe. We could create new countries as quickly as the people could translate the content. We could launch in any currency, and um, and it was amazingly flexible. We could give marketing teams control over the content and the products they offered and the prices they charged. Uh, and that powered the company through a very rapid period of growth and enabled us to expand into 19 countries, for example. Uh, so in whenever you take somebody else's money, and we take them some angel investment in 2000, and then we took some VC money in 2006. Whenever you take somebody else's money, they want to get their money back, plus, you know, plus a lot more. And there is this pressure to give them what they want. And at the beginning, I had 25 angel investors, and probably 15 of them were sophisticated city people who hoped for the best but didn't care if it all went horribly wrong. They were willing to take the risk. And the other 10 were like mates of my dad who phoned me every month asking me when they were going to get their money back and actually threatened me if, you know, after two years because it was taking too long. So I felt this pressure. But we'd taken professional VC money in 2006. And when it came to 2010, um, they were starting to get itchy feet. They were saying, what's your exit plan? Are you going to sell the company? Are you going to raise more money? Um, you know, we'd like to start to think about when we can cash out as VCs. And we started talking to um, competitors in the industry, and there was a very large US company that was interested in us, uh, and we negotiated with them, and they said, right, we're going to buy your company, and this is the amount of money we're going to pay, and we were like, that's an amazing amount of money, thanks, that's great. We went through all the planning, due diligence, uh, they started to draw up personal contracts for us all, um, but the deal fell apart. We got by it, it was not going to happen, and it, and it didn't. And we reflected in late 2010, why didn't we sell the company? Why, why weren't we attractive enough for them to go ahead with the deal? What enabled them to get distracted? And for various reasons, Moonpig was the answer. Um, 
we had a business that was turning over tens of millions of pounds, but not big enough to float to do an IPO. We had a business that um, was profitable, but made all of that profit in just three weeks of the year, just before Christmas. And if we got that period wrong, we made no profit in the year. And investors saw that as very risky. Um, and we had a business that was mostly focused on UK and France. And whilst we were present in other countries, we didn't really have a very diversified customer base. And for various reasons, Moonpeak was the answer. They had four peaks a year instead of one. They doubled our turnover, doubled our profit, um, and uh, they gave us access to a completely different set of customers. And we just thought, if we put these two companies together, we're going to be a much more interesting group. Um, so I've known Nick, Nick Jenkins for years. Some of you may have seen him on Dragon's Den. Uh, we started at roughly the same time. We used to print stuff for them at Moonpig. He used to print cards for us. And we even joked about putting, not jokes, but we talked about putting the two companies together in about 2006. And I think he went to the pub for a beer with my CFO, James, and he said, yeah, I'll sell it to you for two million quid. And I said, piss off, I'm not going to pay two million quid for Moonpig. But in 2011, we bought it for 120 million pounds. So my bad. But to be fair, during that period, 2006 to 2011, Moonpig had become a giant. And the jingle that you all know today, that TV campaign started around 2006, 2007, um, and they've done an amazing job growing the company. And um, yeah, adding it in was expensive, but very, very much worth it, and we never regretted that decision at all. We also went on a, a buying spree across Europe. We bought um, a big company in, in Germany called Poster XXL, which gave us a German factory access to the German market. We, tr we tried for about three years to break into Germany and we couldn't get to what we called a podium position. We couldn't get to first, second or third in the market. And our general advice is if you, if you try and compete in the market and you can't get to first, second or third, you give up. But we ended up buying them and then we went to first in the German market. Uh, we bought uh, our belly in Netherlands, although that was after I left, uh, Hoffman in Spain, uh, and Greece in Belgium. Um, actually, sorry, in the Netherlands as well. So, yeah, m and mergers and acquisitions, was a big part of what we did, and um, it makes sense when you complement each other, you fill each other's gaps. So back in 2006, when we merged with a French company, Photoways, we were really good at tech, and we were good at customer service, and kind of the core mission. They were much better at marketing and industrializing the factory. And so when we put the two companies together, we like filled each other's gaps, and it made perfect sense. And it was cased with all of these that we, um, we felt, felt that they filled gaps in, in our proposition. So, slightly weird graphics. So we uh, we continued to grow, and I guess there were three things, or a couple of things that were going on with um, reaching that level of scale. We uh, I can't believe it myself actually, but we somehow got to about three hundred million pounds of revenue for the group. Um, we were in nineteen countries, as I said. Um, some of them worked really well, some didn't work work well, and shut some down later on, but uh, these were mostly kind of virtual presences. You know, we were still running everything from both London and Paris, but uh, we would have a presence in Poland and even New Zealand and places like that, Ireland. Um, we had 1,400 people employed, um, a lot of people in production, in the factories, and a lot of people in custom services, but still a huge number in uh, tech and marketing. Um, so we were, you know, a serious scale at that point. To come back to this idea of value and fairness, um, businesses only work when you figure out what your customers want and you deliver that value to them. You have to figure out what is it they want. In our case, they wanted to be memory keepers of their house, to, to give a gift that had emotion attached to it, whether it's a, a Moonpig card or a... Uh, you know, a canvas of, of a loved one. 
So we, we recognize that emotion and that need for us to have perfect execution um, and to give people good value. And also fairness in that we, we recognize that we had to um, be fair to our customers, treat them as we wanted to be treated ourselves and our employees as well. With 1,400 people, we had a lot of care and duty and made sure we look after people. Um, and we became much more aware of our responsibility. I remember a period <laughs> around 2014 where we were taking a serious look at our carbon footprints. We did things like ripping out air conditioning in our factories and putting in passive water-based cooling systems. We completely changed the recycling around the photographic chemistry, um, switched from what was very cool polypropylene packaging, which of course takes like 500 years to break down to um, compostable cardboard packaging. And, um, and also just aware of the different groups within our company. I, I remember, uh, I'm not expressing a political view here, but when the Brexit uh, referendum happened in 2016, the following morning, we ended up having a, a town hall with our staff, in an impromptu one, because people were really upset and really confused about what this meant for an international company like us. We used to ship products through, Eurotun through the Eurotunnel every day. Um, so we talked to them and said, look, we don't know what this means, but you know, we're going to check it out, and whatever happens, we're going to get through it. But I remember we, we looked, and in our head office in London, we had 60 different nationalities represented on our payroll. So a very diverse workforce who just wanted to know that we were looking out for them and that we would try and find a way to continue our operations, whatever happened politically. And, of course, this constant uh, need for an exit. Our investors were now very, very impatient. It had uh, got to nine or ten years since they put their money in, so they were putting pressure on us to achieve some kind of exit. So, exit. First of all, when you exit a company, the company doesn't go anywhere. Um, it stays up, up running. It's, it's still got... Normally the same employees, the same products, the same website, everything carries on. <clears throat> but the main thing that changes is the investors. You swap out one set of investors for a different set of investors. And um, sometimes the founders leave during an exit and sometimes they don't. And our exit came in 2016 and I didn't leave the company, I stayed on. Um, <clears throat> but there are three different paths to exit, um, which applies to all companies. You can do a trade sale, like there's an Apple Beats example. Beats was an independent brand, a much smaller brand, but it ended up selling to Apple. Apple said, you built a cool brand, cool products, we'll buy you. You're still going to continue to operate as Beats, but we now own you. So that's an example of a trade sale. The other one is IPO, uh, which is where you list your company on a public market. So you swap your private investors for a whole bunch of public investors. And uh, for companies, it's, uh, if they've reached a certain level of scale, it's a good way to uh, achieve an exit. I personally don't like the idea of an IPO because you have to do everything in public and the market tends to take a very short-term view. If you don't keep increasing your revenue and profit every three months, you get punished and your share price goes down. Um, a lot of businesses can operate much more healthily if they take a kind of one or two year view about where they want to get to and can build in, in private. Um, so then uh, the final option is private equity, where you sell to very big professional investors who are willing to take a three to five year view of that your company can grow. And that's what we ended up doing. I have to say we tried all three. We were like for sale for six years. So 2010 was the trade sale attempt, which failed. Uh, we tried IPO twice, but the market conditions weren't right. And we tried private equity twice, and it finally worked in 2016. So, I just want to summarize some of my lowlights along the journey. So first of all, as you've heard, it's a long, for me it was a 17-year journey through Photobox. So, Running an entrepreneurial business can be slow, 
can mean really hard, can mean lost sleep, can mean becoming poor. Um, it's very stressful, and I'm not the only one who's experienced burnout running my own business. It happens a lot. Um, code reds, I mentioned them briefly, they were like a constant theme at Photobox. There was always something blowing up or going wrong. I remember in particular, there was one December 2013, I was at a school event in a pub, and I got a leave on my phone saying um, the factory in London had gone offline, the content had gone down. This was the 5th of December, one of those three weeks where we made all our profit in the Photobox brand. And we were probably running at 120% capacity right then, printing photos, canvases, books, mugs, t-shirts, everything as gifts. And for the factory to go offline, not unusual. So I said to the guys, oh, don't worry, it'll probably come back in an hour, it's probably a BT outage or something. Got home, hour later, still offline, two hours later, still offline. I stupidly stayed up all night with my ops team monitoring the situation. I should have gone to bed and got some sleep. By 6 a.m. I called a war room meeting at our factory. We went there. Um, we, we tried to get satellite trucks to bring the, you know, the comms link so we could download people's images to print them. Uh, but it was the night that Nelson Mandela had died and we couldn't get a satellite truck anywhere. All the news organizations were busy. Um, we phoned uh, a friend of somebody who worked for EE and he said, oh, I've got these new things called 4G routers, so I'll bring one over. So we ended up using some 4G experimental routers. And the main thing was we went out to PC World and bought about 20 hard disks and got couriers to drive between East London, where we had a high-capacity high downlink, and we were shipping stuff. Anyway, big drama. We were offline for 36 hours. We had to bribe a BT engineer to fix the fiber. What had happened was thieves had gone into the Park Royal area and dug up all the copper cabling and spooled it out, but in the process of stealing the cabling, they cut through the fibers. They cut through our primary and our secondary link. Um, that same week, we had our website go offline due to a submarine dragging its anchor through a cable in the North Sea, and we had an asbestos break out in our London office. So, these things happen. Uh, that was a particularly memorable week, but uh, there will be disasters that before you. I talked about the investors. There's constant pressure from investors. When you had to take other people's money, you, you've got to expect the phone calls. And um, yeah, we're just about to go into a recession, if you haven't heard. And we had two of them at Photobox. Can you see the great stripes on the screen? Yeah. So we had, um, the first recession was the, uh, the, 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 uh, the after effects of the NASDAQ crash. This is the NASDAQ index, by the way. Um, so that, that period in 2000 when the uh, internet bubble burst caused a global recession which lasted about a year and we also had the famous credit crunch recession that we lived through and they were enormously challenging for us as what was an early stage startup at the beginning and a scaling company in the middle but they also had their opportunities so they felt terrible, they felt Oh my God, what are we going to do? Suddenly our business has grown to a halt. Um, nobody's spending any money, everybody's panicking, don't know what to do. But the first one, we, as I said, we went into hibernation mode. And with a, a, just a handful of people, we became UK market leader. We had a chance to grow without com competitors getting funded or entering our space, without anybody putting the funny stunts. We just had slow growth during a recession, and that actually helped us. In the second one, uh, 2008, we, uh, again, we had the time to build my disastrous websites without too much competitive pressure. And also, we realized that everybody, like now, was feeling very poor after the credit crunch. And um, they were looking for ways to save money as families, and we were thinking, well, instead of taking a loved one out for a dinner for their birthday, which might cost £50, pounds, why not give them a £19 pounds personalised calendar that could be just as emotional and last for a year? So we, we focused on value and giving people what they wanted to achieve, which is this emotional connection, at a low price point. In effect, we were trying to become a kind of IKEA of 
photo printing. And it really works. We, we found a way to produce cheaper, more efficiently, and again, we have very less, we have a lot less competitive pressure. So I know we're all about to go into a recession, and that's generally a bad thing, but it also can create opportunities for businesses. So getting close to the end now, this, um, just to repeat my personal evolution, which I'm sure some entrepreneurs go through. I, I came into this business never having managed anybody else. You know, I was 35, but I've never run a team. Um, I certainly haven't run my own business. And I realized I had a lot of naivety, some hubris. I'd made a lot of mistakes. And, um, and I wasn't managing my, my health and my stress well. And uh, there was a lot about me personally that needed to change. I, I started running and swimming and things like that after this burnout. So I think just recognizing my own weaknesses and needing to connect to people to solve those was an important step. Like I said, my, uh, my health, I wasn't really investing in it, particularly during the very busy years, so fixing those things was transformative for me. Um, I, I learned to connect to people. I think for the first two years of Photobox, I just didn't talk to people. I was kind of head down trying to get a million things done. And when I finally emerged and started to go out and talk to people about good things and bad things, I, I felt like I was solving problems much better. And, and actively learning as well. Firing myself and having a new CEO gave me an enormous learning opportunity to learn from somebody more skilled than me who knew the ropes and knew how to solve problems, knew how to grow companies, knew how to sell companies, knew how to raise money. And um, that was like a masterclass. And like I said during that low point for me, to come back to a business and to reevaluate it with fresh eyes, to look at what's wrong, what am I spending my time on every week? Is that helping our company mission or not helping it? That was a really useful lesson. So uh, I left Photobox in 2017, in the spring. Um, it wasn't hard to walk away. It felt like a different company. Like in a good way, it had moved on, it was much bigger. My own personal role in that company was much less than it was at the beginning, and it was the right time for me to move on. I, um, I did what anybody who sells a business does. I went on a few travel trips with my family, I had some personal projects, I did some fun things, and then I started to get a bit bored after about six months, and eventually I went to work for a much smaller, SaaS business called PeopleBox, which was warehouse management software. And it was not that that was like a super interesting problem for me, but this was a business that was in trouble. It had stopped growing, it, the, the investors didn't quite know what to do with it, and it was an interesting kind of tidying up um, exercise, and after 20 months we had fixed some of the main issues that were wrong with that company and we sold it. And that sale went through just before COVID. So then COVID happened, we were all on Zoom. Uh, I had no active work at that time, but one of the things I did was I gave out calendar links to people where they could book half hour coaching sessions with me for free. And I'd say, if you're an individual or a company or a team, I don't care, just, and you want half an hour's advice from somebody who's been through a tough journey, I'm really happy to do it. And I had, some amazing conversations. I felt like I learned as much as the people on the other end of the call. Uh, and some of those connections were useful to me and I stayed with them and I ended up doing work with them or joining their organization or whatever. So just that kind of random connecting really helped me during that period. And since then I've done a combination of some paid advisory work for scaling companies and some pro bono stuff. So pro bono, um, it's just, I mean, one of the great luxuries of selling a company is you get to decide how you want to spend your time. And uh, for me, the things that I like spending time on are um, organizations that help people who are disadvantaged or experiencing um, wealth inequality or homelessness um, or early on in their career and need advice. I work with one uh, accelerator fund for climate 
um, companies, the primary tech companies called Carbon 13. Uh, Black Valley is a, um, an accelerator of underrepresented founders. I just had actually a meeting with one of the companies I've been mentoring uh, around the corner in a Riding House Cafe before this. And uh, one of my personal passion, pa um, passions is an, an organization with a terrible name called Patriotic Millionaires, but it's based on a US organization called that. And we, we basically campaign for more progressive taxation for people with high wealth. Um, and I won't bore you with the, the, the in-depth story, but one thing I feel strongly about is I'm an entrepreneur and I had a successful outcome from my business. Not everybody does. Entrepreneurship is a risky game, as somebody said, and it's like a process of natural selection, and some businesses work amazingly, some fail, a lot fail. But for the people who succeed, there can be very high returns and high wealth. And it's easy to take that wealth and say, look at me, I'm amazing. My, my personal creativity and effort and hard work has led to this outcome. But the fact is that I created Photobox and I was able to hire educated, healthy people from the UK workforce. I was able to benefit from um, customers around the country that had access to broadband and computers and the internet and stable electricity supplies. And I was able to raise money in a, an economy that was operating fairly and well with a good legal structure and good fundraising rules and everybody had trust that the money they'd invest would be handled correctly. And all of those societal elements didn't come for free. This country has invested for decades in providing a stable environment for business. And my business thrived because I built on top of that foundation. And so when I turn around and say, yeah, but look, I'm, look at me, I'm great, I made all this money. I, I did it because I was benefiting from all that societal investment. And I feel that people like me could afford to put more back into society and enable more people to go to university for free and uh, more businesses to thrive with support from um, the government and their friends and family and angels. So, uh, I'm just going to summarise now my three main lessons that I feel hopefully are relevant to you in the room. So first of all, I saw that 40% of you want to create an entrepreneurial business in the next five years. And that's great. Maybe you've got a great idea and you feel like you've got all the elements ready to start your business. But don't rush it. Many of you that are looking at it are very young. Maybe you haven't had a lot of industry experience yet, maybe you haven't built up your savings. There's no rush. You can afford to learn by working for somebody else, get some income, get some savings, get some experience. Like, I, I've met people that say things like, oh, I want to revolutionize the coffee business, and I'm like, oh, have you ever worked in a cafe? No, 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 but, you know, it's okay, it's like, I've got the theory. So, you know, go and learn. Make sure you're ready, make sure you've got the right foundations for your business. Secondly, no business will survive unless it delivers value to its customers. If you don't solve your customers' problems, they won't keep coming back. So make sure you're delivering that value. And personally, I always treat it partners, employees with fairness. You, you've got to leave something on the table for the other person. Don't, don't be ruthless, be fair. And finally, um, serendipity. Just remember that the role of an entrepreneur is to make connections between things. Make, embrace those random connections. Embrace those random conversations. Don't be afraid to talk to people about your ideas and your fears. They'll tell you something, they'll give you some feedback, maybe that's going to be useful to you. But uh, make those connections.